uh, start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth uh, Stellar Lecture Series of the year. Today, our speaker is Josh Hayes, who is doing his PhD in the University of Manchester, and who will be talking about his work on using spectroscopy to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, sorry, my computer has just uh, decided to stop. It's just decided to close the program I needed. Uh, right. <laughs> Hello. Um, let's try this again. Uh, right, if I share my screen. Uh, right, can we see this? No, we've got the wrong screen. There we go. Can we see a presentation? Is this working? Yeah, that works. Yes, but right. Hello, everyone. Um, so some of you may have caught bits and pieces of uh, that. Uh, my name's Josh. I am a, a PhD student at the University of Manchester. Um, I study exoplanets. Uh, more specifically, I look at their atmospheres. And sort of what I wanted to do today was take you through a little bit of a um, an overview of sort of what is a, come on, click on, there we go. Um, sort of looking at what it is I do um, and sort of um, what it is you can do with, um, or the power of this technique that I use, which is known as transmission spectroscopy, uh, which is used to work out what the actual atmospheres of these planets are made out of. Um, so first up, I'm gonna try and answer a very quick, uh, Basic question, uh, which is, what is a planet? Um, so there is a there is a there is a definition for this. Um, first off, it has to orbit a star. Second off, it needs to be round. Um, if it's not big enough, um, it won't become round. It's probably an asteroid or something similar. Um, and third, it needs to have done what's known as clearing its neighbourhood around its orbit which is basically you can kind of think of it as if I had a big old um, plane of asteroids and stuff, um, if I've got my planet going around in a circle, has it basically like, like some sort of cosmic Roomba hoovered up um, everything around that uh, its orbital path? So is it clear of debris? Um, also, it has to be below the hydrogen burning limit because otherwise that's a star. Um, there are a few other classifications. Um, so the obvious one is if it hasn't done this last bit um, or step three, it's known as a dwarf planet, which is why Pluto is sad looking at the corner uh, because it has not done, uh, it has not cleared its neighborhood. Um, it crosses the orbit of um, Neptune and therefore loses that fun. Um, also, um, if it doesn't orbit a star, it could either be what's known as a free-floating planet, um, which is cool. Um, it could either be something that has formed completely externally to a star, just a bunch of gas and rocks that have clumped together, or it could have been fired out um, from a solar system. Uh, sort of, uh, if you've got, say, early on, you've got a couple of planets going around a star. One of them might, one of them, a big one, say, might move in. Uh, and as it moves in, you've got an angular momentum um, increase. So that speed, it starts to speed up. The angular momentum of the system has to be conserved. Um, and so basically often what happens is there's a bunch of gravitational interactions and it just catapults a smaller planet out into interstellar space, um, which is, yeah, I, li I like the idea of that. Alternatively, if it doesn't go around a star, it's a, it might be a moon. More on moons later. Um, so I've defined a planet, um, great, exoplanets. These are planets that go around stars that aren't the sun. Um, so how do you find them? We know that they're there. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick whittle stop tour through the um, primary methods that we use for looking for these things. Um, so first off, we've got um, this. So this is a method known as radial velocity. Um, and there's also its corollary, well, sort of, partner thing of astrometry. Um, and the basic idea of this is a planet doesn't technically orbit a star. Um, your planet and star orbit the barycenter of, or their center of mass as a system. 
Um, so your planet orbits a star and the star also wobbles. Um, if you are looking along the line of sight, um, as your star moves towards you, um, the light it's emitted gets blue shifted, and as it moves away from you, it gets red shifted. Um, and so what you can see in this little GIF is we've they've just chosen some arbitrary, some known uh, spectral lines, and you can see them wobbling backwards and forwards. So if we plot these over time, you get a nice little sine wave, and you can do all sorts of things like work out the mass of a planet. Um, if you're not edge onto the disk though. Um, you can instead do a thing known as astrometry, which is where you see the star visibly wobble. Um, so the Gaia Space Telescope, um, which is super precise um, in its measurements of where everything is, um, is gonna be able to do a lot of this. Um, so Gaia has been sent up to, among other things, um, track the position of stars over time. Um, and if we see a star doing this little circular wobble around the center, it means that we might have found a um, planet that we wouldn't otherwise be able to detect because your um, well, because it's not moving backwards and forwards. We're not actually seeing any radial velocity change from this. We're not seeing any red or blue shift, so we wouldn't discover it otherwise. So that's one method. We've got another method. Um, so this is one that my supervisor, Amy Karens, used to work on quite a lot. He still works on it, but I don't care about it. But I feel like he would. Be sad if I didn't mention it now. Um, so this is gravitational microlensing. Um, the idea behind this is that planets warp space or things warp space. Um, and as you, if, if you've got, you've got two things here. So we've got at the back, we have, actually, I'm going to take that back to start. Um, so here we have a star. I'm going to call this the source. Uh, we also have here some sort of heavy object, a lens. Um, what we get as this moves across um, is that as light travels towards us from the star, um, as the planet itself enters between us and the star, it acts, it gravitationally bends the light, which would otherwise have missed us. So if you carry on this straight line here, that wouldn't have made it to the telescope. Whereas now, because it's being bent towards us, we're getting more light. So down here in the bottom, you can see a plot of brightness over time as our planet tracks along. Um, and so you get this nice little loop um, hump that says, hey, something's gone in front of your source star. Um, that's great. So this is a way of detecting free floating planets, like I mentioned earlier. But what if you have a planet or a star which is host to a planet. Um, what does that then look like? Um, and there's a bunch of really complicated fancy maths that happens with this. I don't really understand it, but the bottom line is you get something that looks a bit more funky. So what you can see here is you've got a couple of spikes. Um, these are what's known as caustics. And they're very similar to if you, when you get a glass of water on a sunny day, put it on the tabletop, you get all that sort of pattern of light refracting. Um, the very bright bits are known as caustics. Um, and basically what's happening is you can think of this planet uh, star lens as that glass of water. Um, and as you move it across, if you put a little detector down, you would pass along some of these bright patches. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing cut throughs of this. Um, like I say though, I'm not gonna talk about this anymore, so don't worry about it. Um, you could also just take a picture. Um, so if you've got a star and you block it out, suddenly you might see a planet. Um, basically you've got all of this um, infrared light or just general light reflecting off your planet. Um, it gets swapped out by your host star um, and if you block it out you can suddenly see it. This has been done. Um, so what I have here is the only movie to date of exoplanets. Um, so this is a um, series of images, uh, direct images, which were taken over uh, seven years from a telescope in Hawaii at the Keck Observatory. Um, and all four of these planets, uh, so you've got one, two, three, and then there's a fourth one out here. All four of these are more massive than Jupiter. 
and they are big. Um, the closest one in one, um, this has an orbital period of about 40 years. Uh, this one out here has about 400 years. What you can also see though, is that there's sort of like a sweet spot for being able to see the planets. So it kind of depends on the size of your planet, but also as you get further away, less light is getting to the planet. And so less light is there to be reflected by the planet. So this one right out on the edge is almost right on the edge of visibility. Whereas the close in ones, oh, they are bright. Um, ideally you wanna be sort of where these two are because then you're completely clear of this cluster of interference uh, just from the optics and the way that it works. So those are some ways of discovering planets. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk about the transit method because that is the one that I use and interests me the most. Um, so of all of these, aside from maybe direct imaging, this is kind of the simplest um, method to think about. So the planet goes in front of star and blocks out light. Um, if you see less light periodically, like a sort of blip, as demonstrated here, um, if you see that periodically, you found a planet, well done. Um, and the reason that we, I like this method so much is that it's incredibly powerful. Um, unlike um, things like microlensing, uh, you've got multiple chances to follow up on your host planet, on your planet. So with, with microlensing, usually what will happen is there'll be some people vaguely monitoring the sky, they'll see a star start to get brighter and sort of be like, oh, maybe something's happening here. They'll send out an alert. Lots of telescopes on the ground will point to look at the star. We'll get loads of data, observations of this um, microlensing light curve. We'll all be really happy and then oh that's it now that microlensing event's never going to happen again and um, whereas transits because it's just an orbit and we're using the host star we can do this almost as many times as we want um it's entirely dependent though on the host parameters and how long an orbit takes if you've got something known as a hot jupiter which again talk a little bit more about later but very very close in planets they can have orbital periods of a couple of days um or sort of seven or eight days and then if you're looking for something like Earth, you're going to have to wait a year to get another one of those. And if you're looking for something like, I don't know, Saturn, you're going to have to wait quite a long time. So we've definitely got a bias towards close-in planets. Um, so it's not just me that gets excited about transit method. Um, NASA did before I did, um, because, you know, I am young and NASA has existed for longer than I have. Um, this is the Kepler Space Telescope. Um, it was launched in 2009. Uh, it is still up there somewhere, but it is now trash. Um, it was decommissioned, or at least they turned it off um, in at the end of October 2018. Um, so Kepler, during its lifetime, uh, discovered um, two th about 2,300 2, planets um, and another 2,400 candidates. Um, so that's a lot, but the, really, the thing that's so cool about this is that um, Kepler didn't look at the whole sky. Um, you stick your arm out in front of you and make a fist. The area of your fist is roughly the area that Kepler looked at. Um, it looked very, very deep as well, um, towards sort of towards the galactic center. But um, that's 2,300 planets within an area the size of your fist. Think how many you'd get if you were able to look everywhere. Um, so that, that would be nice. Um, some of you might know the story of Kepler, um, some of you might not. Um, so Kepler was launched, as I say, in 2009 um, and then so the way that these telescopes, once they're in space, uh, sort of orientate themselves um, is primarily using things known as reaction wheels. So these are basically gyroscopes. Um, you can't really use um, reaction control systems to get the fine control that you need um, when you're trying to point a telescope. So they can use it to sort of 
they can use like an actual small rocket engine to roughly orientate the scope the telescope and then they need they need these gyroscopes to orientate it uh finally so you need three of them to do all three xyz directions because otherwise you you don't have the control so Kepler launched with four reaction wheels um one of them failed and then in may 2013 another one failed and everyone went ah well it was nice while it lasted um, so they were now only able to tilt the telescope basically in a plane. They miss their, they then lack the ability to um, hold its position in that third dimension. Um, and some people came up with the absolutely ingenious idea of how to get around this. Um, so Kepler orbits the sun. The sun gives off photons, um, radiation. Ra there is a thing called radiation pressure, um, which is just basically a small amount of, um, like, well, whenever a photon, you, a photon hits you or gets absorbed by you, there is a small amount of momentum uh, transferred. Um, so what they proposed was that if this is the sun and this is the plane of Kepler's orbit, if you always have Kepler looking along that plane, you can use the reaction, the uh, radiation pressure to stabilize Kepler. So you don't actually need to be able to control it in that final plane uh, because you're basically replacing one of the reaction wheels with the sun, um, which I think is such an awesome idea. Um, anyway, they did this. This became known as the K2 mission um, and did a lot of other sort of extra stuff looking uh, for gravitational lensings and other things. People still look for planets, but it didn't have the same, uh, same scope. Um, so, like I said, uh, Kepler is dead. Long live TESS and, and GTS. Uh, so on the left here, this is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This launched in April 2018 um, and is going to be great. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second. Um, on the right here is the Next Generation Transit Survey, um, NGTS, which is a ground-based uh, sky survey in Chile. Um, so basically what both of these do is they monitor the brightness of stars over a long period. Um, and they monitor them looking for this periodic loop, loop, loop. They're basically um, sort of Soviet era radar machines but for planets. Um, so TESS, and the reason it's so exciting, um, so TESS basically is going to look at pretty much the entire sky. So on the right here I have um, a comparison of where TESS is looking, which is all the blue bits, and this this little yellow patch up here is the original Kepler mission. So Tess, Kepler found about 2,000 planets in that area. TESS is going to find somewhere between, depending on who you ask, 20 and 200,000 planets. And unlike Kepler, it is observing much, much closer and brighter stars. So Kepler observed very deep, which was great for actually being able to look for planets. Um, but not so great for being able to actually follow them up. Um, so the problem with looking at really faint stars is that if you want to check them out from the ground, uh, you can't see them because the atmosphere gets in the way. And so most of the planets that Kepler found aren't of much use. Every single planet that Tess discovers will be orbiting a star which we can look at from the ground. So every single one of those 20 or two to 200,000 planets will be one that we can theoretically look at and do follow-up observations on. That's so exciting. Um, like it's basically an entirely new era um, that we're entering. Um, so that's how we find things. Um, I'm gonna take you on a little, what have we found? This is, what, what's the state of play as of actually, I think about six to eight months ago when I 
first wrote this talk. But what is the state of play before the pandemic got in the way and I didn't really update my slides? Um, so what have we found? These are some confirmed planets. Um, so this is uh, taken, oh, ignore that date, that's a while ago. Um, but this is starting to give you an idea of what we're seeing. So we're starting to see two sort of big population types. Um, so hot Jupiters, which are planets with a radius roughly equal to that of Jupiter and an orbital period. That basically means that they've got to be very, very close to the host star. Um, so therefore they're warm or hot. Um, the reason that we find so many of these is that they are very easy to find in transits. Um, like I said earlier, you're looking for something giving you periodic uh, signals. You need at least three of them. You're far more likely to find something close in because you get more of the signals and you're far more likely to find something big because it gives you a bigger signal. Um, so we also find these um, this population of super Earths and mini Neptunes. So there's a sort of there's what's known as a mass radius relation, which is kind of looking at at what point does the size of a planet mean that it's stopped being rocky, a terrestrial type planet and is now a Neptune, a small Neptune ice giant type planet, because obviously these are two very different things. I would much rather live on Earth than on Neptune. Um, and so what people have done is they've actually looked at um, what is this separation, like what is the likelihood between these two things? And we found that there's a, um, what's known as the Fulton gap, um, where if you plot the sort of a histogram of your occurrence rates of planets based on their size, uh, there is a, what's known as the Neptune, the sub-Neptune desert, which is this little dip in your occurrence rate between super Earths, which is in pink, and Neptune-sized planets, which is in blue. Um, and we think that this basically comes down to, as planets are evolving, you've got, um, so let's say I'm a terrestrial planet. I move close to my star. That's fine. I'm a rock. Um, not much is going to happen to me. Um, let's say I am a small Neptune and I move closer to my planet, to my host star. This starts to become a bit more of an issue if I want to maintain integrity because I am made of a bunch of volatile gases. Um, if you put me close to a star, I am likely to heat up and lose all my gases. Um, so there we, what people think is that there's this, um, there's this effect so it's photo evaporation, um, which is if you take a small Neptune and move it close to a star, a lot of its atmosphere disappears and now it's too small to sort of hold itself together and it just dissolves. Um, so there's a, a, a minimum radius that you need to be as a small Neptune to be able to um, overcome that. Like you've then got enough gravitational force to still hold most of your, like keep most of your atmosphere in before it, um, basically boils off. Um, that's nice. I'm now going to take a little um, journey down memory lane and um, give you a glimpse into some various uh, or, or a long running soap opera within the exoplanet community. So planets, yay. We live on a planet. I hope this is not news to anyone. Um, I also hope that it is not the news that we have a moon. Um, and so what a lot of people have been wondering about is, could there be, or how many planets have moons? Can we detect them? Um, because a lot of sort of what people are kind of thinking is, well, I mean, we're finding a lot of Jupiter-sized planets. Um, there's no way we could live on those. So even if we find one in what's known as the habitable zone, um, not much interest to us, right? But what if they had a moon? If you've got a moon in a habitable zone, could that be somewhere that you could live? So obviously there's a lot of excitement around the idea of exomoons. And in 2018, um, there was a big hoo-ha in the press where um, some people, uh, Alex Teaching, Alex, Alex Teachy and David Kipping 
um, published a paper saying we might have found an exomoon and all these headlines appeared. Um, so I'm going to sort of take you through that that paper and then the subsequent spat um, of people all going, it's yes, no, yeah, ooh, mate, no, um, which is still going on till today. Um, so functionally, what happened? Um, Teacher Kipping and Smith, they, all they took a bunch of observations um, of different stars and they tried to fit a, uh, they fitted a model to, um, to all of the light curves from this. Um, and so this figure 11 here, um, sh it shows the significance of the possible detection of an exomoon. Um, it isn't there is an exomoon, it's basically something that is around zero is like, well, it's not worth looking at. If, if it's something that's significantly deviant, then it means that there's at least something going on. Um, so there was one planet, Kepler 1625b, um, which was about four sigma away from, well, a significance of plus four, which basically meant something's up here. Um, and they plotted these light curves and they looked at them. And what you've got here on the right is those original light curves. So what you would normally expect to see with a single planet is just a single nice sort of U-shape uh, trough. What you can hopefully see with this is that there are a bunch of non-uniformities to this, um, which implies maybe you've not just got a planet transiting, but you've got a planet with a moon, and that moon is large enough, depending on where it is in its orbit, to, e to cause a transit signal. Um, so they took this, they followed up um, with some observations from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the observations at the top are the original ones that I just showed you, and then the three at the bottom are all the same data fitted with different models. And what you can see, and what everyone got very excited about, was this on the right here. Um, so let's zoom in on this. Um, what we've got here with the dotted line is what's known as the predicted T0. So this is when we were expecting the middle of the transit to be. Um, what you've got with the solid line is when it was. Um, so this can occur from a numerous different ways. Um, you can either have, if you've got a, another planet in your system, that can have a gravitational pull, um, an effect on your transiting planet. So if, you're, if your transiting planet is ahead of the other planet, it can pull back on it, slow it down, and means that your transit appears late, or vice versa. If it's behind it, it can get tugged forward, and your transit appears a little bit early. Um, or it can be because you've got a planet, a, a moon going around your planet, because they orbit each other. So at this point, where your moon, your planet is closer, it's going to get thrown ahead, and where it's behind, where it's where, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. It's very difficult without being a person. Um, so either this TTV, transit timing variation, is due to a moon or another planet. So we only have four transits. So we can't really do very much with the um, with a second planet idea. We don't have enough data to constrain it. But there is a big old dip in the right-hand side of that plot, um, which is exactly what people said, hey, this is exciting. Um, could that be a moon? Um, so these people did the paper. They went through, they tried fitting various different models. Um, and the basic outcome that they got was that their host planet, um, sort of Jovian mass and radius. Yes, excellent. Right, we've come across this before. And then their exomoon had a mass that was comparable with that of Neptune or Uranus. That's a big moon. Um, arguably, it's almost, it is no moon. Um, that's a planet size, but because of our, um, because of what we said earlier, it goes right, it doesn't go around a star, so it can't be a planet, it must be a moon. Um, so their separation is about 40 planetary radii, which is stable, um, which is nice. Um, so the bottom line is this is massive um, as a system. 
And obviously people went, ha, huh. we've never thought about a sort of almost a binary planet system at this point, not really a planet moon system. Um, and so people came up with a sort of alternative explanation. Um, one of the bits, so this was the first sort of paper that said, no, 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 no. Um, what they said with this was, between the first and second papers that were published by TG, um, they upgraded the data reduction pipeline. Um, and actually, if you kind of look at, if you compare the two, um, so on the left here, we've got the original paper, and on the right, we've got the second paper. Um, a lot of the signals that they actually say were there disappear, which is kind of a bit eyebrow raising. So, I mean, with this one, for instance, here, we lose any form of dip in this best fit model and if, instead it moves here and then actually in this bottom one here, it disappears completely seemingly. So there was a sort of dispute over like, is this a systematic from our data reduction? Um, in which case, how do other, what do other models, do other models work? Um, so one of the really, useful questions to ask yourselves as scientists when you're comparing, when you're looking at your best fit model to data is how much of an outlier is this? So if I am testing, so I'm, I'm doing what's known as a Monte Carlo simulation, where basically you're just throwing lots of different combinations of parameters um, into a model and finding which ones fit best. If my best fit one has a, probability that is very similar to ones that are around it. And there's lots of ones that are all clustering around there. Then we can be like, right, cool. This is a very common um, arrangement of parameters. Alternatively, if it's what seems like an outlier, you can be like, well, something else is at work. And what this plot is showing is basically the difference in likelihood or the, the distribution of likelihoods um, between the um, the best fit model and all models. So on the right of each plot is the best fit model. And ideally, what we would like to see is a nice little cluster ramp leading up to that. That's not what we see, uh, which implies that this best fit model is actually something that is an outlier, which means that, is there another explanation? Um, could there be a close in planet? Um, the answer is maybe. Um, so anything within along this line, um, within these two little uh, bands would be allowed. And we can see that, so all of these dots are planets which exist. Um, and we can see that there are planets which exist in these um, uh, parameters, parameter space. So they're feasible planets to sort of question. Um, and when I first gave a talk of this variety, that was where this saga stopped. Um, since then, there have been, there's been another paper which just outright says no. Um, so this is their work compared to the TG work, and they're basically saying the, the moon does not help. Um, in fact, they actually say, they go as far as saying that adding in a moon makes your fit worse. Um, so they've gone as far as to say, this is just, this isn't right. Um, and then earlier this year, the original authors came back and said um, that basically what this previous paper did was they reanalyzed the entire data and now both groups are going, oh, we did it right, you did it wrong. Um, and we don't know. So stay tuned for the next installment of Moon Wars. Um, we may or may not have found an, exo an exomoon. Um, so yeah, right, anyway, that's a, that was a complete aside that took way longer than I expected. Um, so I've got to actually tell you what I do now. Um, so um, I use um, transmission spectroscopy. Um, the basic idea is big, big planet blocks out more light. Um, so, this is 
the only approach I'm going to show you um, it is a calculation for the transit depth. Um, so RP here is your planet radius, and our star is your star radius. Um, if I've got a planet with an, with an atmosphere, um, that atmosphere contains chemicals. Um, some chemicals absorb different wavelengths of light. So if I'm observing a transit at a wavelength that my atmosphere is transparent to, um, my atmosphere disappears, it goes away. Um, and so I get a functionally smaller planet. If I observe at a wavelength where my atmosphere absorbs light, um, my atmosphere is there, it is now opaque, and so my planet is functionally bigger, um, which means that my transit depth is deeper. And so if I observe transits at loads of different wavelengths um, and plot my um, transit depth against wavelength, I get one of these, it's a spectrum. Um, so you can do all sorts of things with this. Uh, for instance, uh, in here, these two little uh, bumps here, that's a sodium doublet. Um, we've also got here at about 1.4, um, we've got the a water signature. So these two big bumps are what I would expect to see for water. Um, so I just thought I'd tell you what it is we can see from this and how we see it. So what affects the spectrum? Bunch of stuff. First up, the equation of state. So this is basically what's in your atmosphere. Um, so different atmospheric components um, lead you to different, uh, different shapes. So this pink one, for instance, that's pure water. Uh, the blue one is what if your atmosphere was like the sun? They're all different, but everything else here is kept the same. All unchanging is just whatever I'm talking about, everything else. There's default parameters down at the bottom. Um, your temperature changes. So even within the same gas, um, if you heat up a gas, you basically turn on and off um, rotational and vibrational energy levels. Um, and once they're turned on, these are new wavelengths which can absorb light um, and can block out light. So you'll end up with a much more feature rich um, spectrum at high temperatures than at lower temperatures. So you can compa again compare the, compare the pink and the uh, orange ones here. Um, your planet mass can also affect it. So what this is doing is with a heavy planet, your planet has a higher gravitational pull and basically pulls in the atmosphere. So your atmosphere itself gets thinner, uh, which means that the changes between maximally transparent and maximally opaque become uh, smaller. So your actual size of your uh, spectral features decreases. Um, you've also got like the basic size of your planet. I'm not gonna to dwell too much on this. And similarly, your star radius, if your star radius is big, then everything's gonna be tiny. Um, one of the other fun things is clouds. Um, we live in Manchester, or I live in Manchester, so like I'm used to clouds. Uh, they exist on other planets. Um, and what they do is exactly the same as here, which is block out any view. Um, so depending on what you're basically measuring as part of this is the highest, um, you can only measure the atmosphere down to the highest cloud level. So the higher up your clouds are, your clouds are basically opaque, which means that this is functionally the base level from which all your atmosphere variations change. So if you've got a clear atmosphere, you can get a huge variation in uh, opacity of your atmosphere, which is this green line here. Because if you've got very, very high clouds, so this is clouds at a pressure of about 100 pascals, although that, that's much higher than here on Earth. Um, it basically flattens your spectrum because no matter what wavelength you look at, there's just cloud permanently. There's also um, radio scattering. Um, so this is um, the idea, not so much of clouds, but of hazes. Um, so this is where I, A, I get my Twitter handle from, but um, also we have um, basically little bits of dust um, in the atmosphere. So this is Rayleigh scatter, um, it purport, it's proportional to one over the lambda to four, um, which means that it much more affects um, longer wavelengths. Yes, longer wavelengths. And um, basically, 
mutes optical features. So we've got here three different, you can see that the spectrum itself is the same, but as I change the value of a Rayleigh scattering, so one is Earth-like, and then just the bigger it is, it's, a, it's an arbitrary scale. This 10,000 one here is mostly here to prove a point, but if you imagine, for instance, you had a planet uh, sort of like Mars. I mean, Mars had a massive dust storm a couple of years ago, where basically there was a, a sandstorm that went around the entire planet. If you've got a planet like that, um, if you were stood on that, you wouldn't be able to see anywhere. But if you put some infrared goggles on, you'd be able to wander about seeing heat signatures or whatever. It's basically like, um, I think it's Mission Impossible 4, where he ends up in a sandstorm with some uh, infrared goggles. But like, it's, it's that um, is what's going on. So that's the basic idea here. So we measure lots of different um, transit depths at different, temperature, uh, different wavelengths, and we can deduce all sorts of things about the wavelength. Um, I'm going to very quickly tell you who I work for. This is Spinner. I came up with the name. Um, so we are the Spectroscopy and Photometry of Exoplanetary Atmospheres Research Network, or Spinner, because it's much easier. Um, so we are a collaboration between Job Rank and um, a group, uh, NARIT, the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand. Um, and we are, I, we think pretty much alone in actually trying to get ready for this new era of transmission spectroscopy. So like I told you before, um, so Currently, we are target starred. Um, all of the planets that were found by Kepler, most of them we can't look up. Um, we can't actually observe from the ground. So if that means that we can sort of manually do it. We can pick, pick planets and be like, I'm going to look at you. Um, TESS, NGCS, Plato, they're going to find a bunch more. Um, so this is a, an example. Um, well, some predictions. So in blue, we have the uh, host stars of planets discovered by Kepler. So you can see that the majority of them are, you, you really need a telescope and the majority of them are faint. TESS, you can see some of them with the naked eye. Um, you could see a lot of them with binoculars. So these are all planets that we can observe from the ground. Um, which is very, very important for us because it means that we don't need to spend billions of dollars um, building something like the JWST, which never gets launched. Um, so suddenly we are in what we call a telescope starved era. Um, so it's this idea that there aren't that many big ground based telescopes. Um, and so ideally, what we want to do is we want to start using lots of smaller telescopes. Um, which is what we're trying to get ready for. Um, so given that there are, we don't actually know how many small telescopes there are in the world. No one has a catalog. Um, but what we can do is we can take um, a network of them um, and say, right, we've got all of these known planets and all of these telescopes. How do we pair them up so that you maximally, you maximize your scientific output? Um, so to do this, we sort of look at um, the idea of does, can, can this telescope even see the planet to start with? Um, and then also things like, does this telescope observe a wavelength that this planet hasn't been seen before? Um, because repeating an observation is, is great, um, but sometimes repeating an observation is not as useful as doing an entirely new one because it breaks degeneracies. Um, so that's what we have done. Um, so Jake Morgan, who I mentioned before I started talking, um, has published a paper on this. Um, and I am looking at incorporating forward modeling into this. Um, more specifically, what do I do? Um, so I'm involved in the modeling, fitting, and exploration of planetary spectra. Um, side of this. So basically I do atmospheric modeling and atmospheric fitting. Um, so I run MCFC or lots of um, retrieval codes. Um, I'm currently in the process of building something called transit fit, which I should have published 
a month ago, but hey, code is buggy. Um, and yeah, I mean, that is pretty much where I'm going to leave it. So to summarize, um, there are a lot of planets out there. Um, there's still um, a lot of stuff we don't know, uh, which is still, which is very exciting. Um, even things that people are saying we've found is still up for debate. Um, so have we found an exomoon? What does that mean? Keep an eye on that. I think it's going to be a very exciting um, saga. Um, we've got very powerful techniques to explore the composition of planets and test is great. That's, that's my final, final line. Um, thank you very much for listening. Have we got any questions? Thank you so much. If people have questions, I guess they can unmute themselves or they can ask in the chat. In the chat. might have had one. Hi, I don't want to just like pop on and interrupt anyone. <laughs> Hi Alice. Hi, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. It's nice to see you. Thanks for doing this today. It's all right. <laughs> um, I just have a few questions because I'm doing like a bit of research about um, astrochemistry and astrobiology and I'm kind of looking into like exoplanets as well. Cool. Um, and it sounds like really relevant to what you're doing with the spectroscopy stuff. Um, I'm just kind of wondering, with your project at the moment, is your main priority to get the target, so to find where the exoplanets are, and then is the later stage to sort of do the spectroscopy techniques to then look into the composition a bit more? So what I, so the position that I put myself in, or I, so yeah, there's sort of like this um, production network, really, if you will. There's, there's, the, there's the finding the planets in the first place, and then there's the analyzing them. Mm. I let other people find things. Um, I can't be bothered. It's trawling through a whole load of data, and I don't find it very interesting. Okay. Um, I work on, so what I'm currently working on is refine um, a technique to basically incorporate load, a lot of physics that we don't currently use when we're finding that transit head. So, I mean, like I, so sort of in a nutshell, um, when we fit these, um, hang on, let's, will this go back for me? Uh, when we're fitting these uh, transit curves, so, uh, oh God. Um, sure, when we're fitting these, uh, Right, my laptop hates me now. There we go. Uh, nope. Yeah, when we're fitting these sorts of light curves, um, we've got lots of different parameters. Um, and often people will observe one planet in loads of different wavelengths, because I mean, that's how we get the spectrum. Um, what they will do quite often, though, is they'll fit things sort of in isolation. Um, when there's the ability to, because we've got multiple different wavelengths, if there are parameters which are say coupled over those wavelengths, often people will break that coupling. So the primary example of this is a thing called limb darkening, which is the idea that if you imagine a star as just a circle, um, you could, the actual brightness of that isn't uniform. It's not a uniform disc. It gets fainter towards the edges basically because there's less star. Yeah. Um, if you imagine how much star you're going through at each point. Um, and if you want to model that as a radial function, you've got lots of different coefficients. Um, those coefficients depend on the wavelength, but they are coupled. Nobody bothers with that coupling, which means that some of the fitting, while like you might end up with a good fit, is lacking some of the fundamental part of the physics. Um, and that's like sort of putting that back in is where I sit at the moment. Okay. And this may sound like a really dumb question, but I haven't really looked at this kind of stuff for a while. So when you say the different wavelengths, because mm -hmm. I keep thinking about in terms of astrochemistry, which you're looking at the different like molecular transitions, but it's, for this, you're not talking about that. You're talking about 
how far away the stars are or what when no, you say no, wavelength it's, it's exactly that. It, it, so i oh, i'm so so you you have a you you've got a star that star gives off multiple different wavelengths of light um yeah. if you look at look for that transit depth at different wavelengths of light um so that can either be through the sort of very basic i put a filter on my camera um you know, just a big old red piece of plastic or whatever or i've got a very fancy prism and fiber optic system that lets me split things up into much much narrower bands mm -hmm. um you can either get what's known as broadband which is primarily where you work in for infrared for optical stuff um or you can have narrowband really high precision where you might actually be say i don't know if you're looking for one particular transition of the sodium doublet or something yeah. if you're really like i really want to see if there's sodium in this atmosphere mm. you could look for that so you can be said be... oh sorry sorry no Karen. so with this sort of method you could potentially see what the atmospheres are actually made of in quite a detailed yes. view yeah that, that 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 is exactly what is what they're trying to do um so for instance there's the T um, something I didn't really have time to mention there's Ariel, which is a an up upcoming telescope, which is it's a space telescope, which is designed to do all of this in one snapshot. Wow. So the thing that's so exciting about that is that all of this ground based stuff generally you can only do one filter at a time, or like a very narrow group of um, sort of high resolution stuff. Mm. Ariel is designed to be like everything from blue to near infrared all at once is, it, is so, aerial ground based or space based no it's space based as well so that's what's so exciting about it is that in theory you can just point and shoot you don't have to worry um, about any of the other interference and stuff yeah yeah exactly. cool and i guess as well like because one of the problem i don't know if this is i've only from my experience one of the problems is as well it's really hard to measure water and stuff because of the atmospheric interference it's really hard to do that from ground-based telescopes is that something that Ariel could potentially do as well is like oh yeah so like I mean so yeah so dealing with what's known as telluric lines which is just basically anything that exists in our atmosphere mm -hmm. um, is hard to is hard to ensure that you've removed yeah um we've got we've gotten quite good at it though as a community um okay. so it, provided that you're not like I don't know you've not actually just like poured a bucket of water onto your telescope um, you can generally remove it okay um but yeah space-based is much better not just because you don't have to deal with telluric lines but um your signals doesn't get into like you don't have to deal with um the issues from atmospheric seeing like all of this just the fact that it can be cloudy mm -hmm. um space space weather is a thing but it's not the same sort of issue as it is on the ground yeah okay. and when i mean with these future projects i mean i don't if anyone else has any questions please go ahead because i could just ask all day <laughs> uh yeah well i i wanted to ask um when you show the sort of all the plants that have been found and the radius yes uh of course there's not really like it's really hard to find planets that are of course like size of the earth or less yes yes um so uh so of course we're still finding very big planets because they're easier to find through transit uh but how is that looking uh, for future research like are we really far from actually observing Earth-like or smaller planets, or so. Good question. I hate it. Um, the <laughs> um, I don't want to put a number on it because you're recording. Um, so the um, I, it's difficult to say. Like, I mean, we found planets that are sort of maybe one point two, one point three Earth masses. Uh, sorry, Earth radii. So that is on of the order of Earth size. Um, it is when you're looking at transits it does just come down to the sensitivity sensitivity of your instrument um test might find some stuff um off the top of my head though 
I like I wouldn't expect us to get to the point where we've got this sort of clustering around where we're able to go look this is all the earths but um there is a there's a thing a thing that is eta earth which is this um the occurrence rate of earth-like planets um which I think currently sits at about 0.4 which um basically this is this says that on average every star has 0.4 earth type planets around it um which is pretty high um like if you're more interested in that i'd go away and look up the occurrence rates of earth um which yeah i i don't know off the top of my head yeah right anything else thank you we, we yeah, have um, a question in the chat Rubish? yes um sorry hi uh, yeah, I was just wondering on the point uh, in, in the Fulton Gap uh, slide, you talked about a theoretical limit uh, for um, for a planet to have an atmosphere with respect to its radius. Uh, yes. How would that uh, sort of uh, uh, fit into the uh, to the argument that uh, this would also depend on how far the planet is from, from the sun so, of that particular uh, system? So uh, wouldn't that also be had to, uh, you don't have to, do you have to also take that into account? Um, when you're uh, finding this minimum? Um, so looking at the filter on gap isn't really my area, but the, so what this is sort of un underlying this is the idea that there's, so there's multiple different planetary formation models. There's either in situ formation, which is where a planet ends up where it started, um, or there's what's known as the migration model, um, which is where larger planets start forming further out and then they move their way in, throwing other planets out of the system as they go, um, and then they migrate in. Um, fundamentally, though, there is still, there's an underlying distribution of where planets are likely to be. Um, there's, what, there's basically a stable region. Um, and so even within that, you've then got an occurrence rate of planets. So all of this is... So this Fulton gap is um, corrected for that occurrence rate, which I think is the underlying part of your question. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I was just having this thing in mind where you have Venus, which is a very dense, uh, there's a very dense atmosphere, but it's much closer to the sun and has a small radius than the Earth. So, uh, uh, okay, yeah. So, so what you're looking, what you're, um, the difference there is that Venus is a terrestrial type planet. Um, so it doesn't really suffer from photo evaporation in the same way. Um, when I'm talking about photo evaporation and sort of this idea that a planet's atmosphere can just be like evaporated, what I'm talking about is an entirely gaseous planet. So one that doesn't have say a physical surface. Um, you are, you are right though, in that this does still exist. So Mercury itself, Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. Basically it's too hot. Um, and it's also too small to keep it there. Whereas Venus is a bit bigger, it's about Earth-sized. So even though it's very, very hot, due to primarily other reasons, um, it still has that gravitational pull to keep it there. All right, All right. thank you. Um, Jutan a, has a question. Um, since there is an increasing number of theoretical parameters and number of data sets due to tests, is there ongoing research on letting machine learning models handle this? Yes. Um, machine learning is a very big thing. Um, if you get an opportunity, as a general um, piece of career advice, if you get a, an opportunity to play around with some machine learning, do it. Um, there are a lot of well-paid jobs in it. Um, but the, I have reservations with machine learning. Um, I, so I have published a paper, uh, one paper, um, which looked at using machine learning to generate priors for Bayesian retrieval. So I'm not gonna to go too much into that, but basically when we're trying all of these different parameters, we define a, a set of priors from which we draw all of these samples. So basically say, right, we think this planet is about Earth size. So we just never bother with Jupiter. Um, the reason I like this is that I think the machine learning has a, um, it can be too prescriptive. Um, there's a big problem with machine learning where if it doesn't know about something, it will never think about it. Um, so 
the sort of well-known example of this um, was a few months ago with Twitter, where they were, so they Twitter uses machine learning type algorithms all the time. Um, one of them being image analysis. So when you upload a, an image to Twitter, um, it puts it in a thumbnail. And ideally it tries to center uh, a face if it can find one. Um, but the issue is that their training data clearly favors white men. Um, so something that went on with that was people were trying things like they would have a, an image that was 20 pictures of Barack Obama and one picture of Mitch, Mitch McConnell. Um, and it would always pitch, pick McConnell no matter where you put him. Um, and so it's things like that um, that make me a little bit like I think machine learning definitely has a place, but I think it needs to be used alongside more traditional models, which actually have the ability to nuance and sample outside of just a simple yes, this, no, this, yes, no, which is what machine learning is. It has machine learning is just a sort of it's a rebranding of statistical analysis, but um, the ultimate end point of that is that it's just a linear regression it's just drawing a line and putting things in boxes um whereas it removes the idea of being able to put something in two boxes or try it out in two boxes and see which one's best it doesn't do that it just picks something up and throws it with me um cool um Time-wise, there's one more question from Alice. Do we want to carry on or? Uh, yes, if yeah. we're good to um, carry on, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, will James Webb help? Yes, um, James Webb is amazing or will be amazing, probably. Um, yeah, um, it's just a very, very good telescope with an incredibly, um, it observes in, near infrared, um, which is where we find most of like the sort of water um, wavelengths, like that, that sort of the main water absorption band. So it's gonna be really good for looking for water in atmospheres, which means that we can do all sorts of things like looking for maybe biosignatures and that sort of stuff. Um, and then the follow up question of, does a planet need to be earth sized to potentially harvest life? I, I think you mean host. Um, I, I hope we're not harvesting life, but um, what supports this? Um, what supports this? Is it just because our planet is the only one we know to have life or finding a twin is a good chance of finding potential life? Um, yeah, good question. What you've basically touched upon there is the idea that the entirety of, of astrobiology is based on a sample size of one. Um, you've got to start somewhere. Um, and we may as well start where we know stuff exists. Um, we think that life evolved in, I think there's like three or four individual time, like ways and the way that we work with DNA, et cetera, is the only one that survived. Um, but there are multiple, or, or, I'm not a biologist, please shout at me if I'm saying that wrong. But um, yeah, um, there's different ways that life could evolve. We're not assuming that everything will be like us, but we may as well look for stuff that is like us because we know what that should look like. Um, that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, if you look at, there's this whole thing at the moment with uh, Venus and I deliberately avoided discussing it because it's ongoing and I don't know enough, but um, they found phosphine in the upper atmosphere or maybe found phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus, um, which is among other things, a potential biomarker. So, one, and I cannot stress this enough, they have not found life on Venus. Um, but one thing that could explain the, the existence of phosphine is biological processes. So potentially a high, a type of um, bacterium maybe that can survive in the very high atmosphere of Venus um, and lives there. Um, that is not something we have on Earth. Um, and not something that we would have expected to see, which is why it was such a big wow when it was maybe discover discovered. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, we've got to start where we know. Um, otherwise, you never start. 
Right, anything else? Right, maybe we can end it here. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you very much, Josh. Thanks for having me. It's really interesting. I don't know how to stop my screen share. There we go. <laughs>